And so this morning, uh, our sermon is uh, Test the Spirits. And it is a study in 1 John chapter 4. So open your Bibles there. And, um, and we're going to begin there. And while we do that, let's have a word of prayer. Father God, be with us now. Lead and guide, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. So 1 John chapter 4, verse 1, and it simply reads like this. It says, Beloved, believe not every spirit, but what? Test the spirits. The King James says, try the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets are going out into the world. Now, this is an interesting passage, and like I said, this is as far as I got. And uh, it's interesting because in the first three chapters in 1 John, we saw that John has mentioned over and over again about being deceived. And he said that there are prophets, people who are among us that have now gone out and they're trying to deceive you. Be careful. And so the warning, we see from the warning that again, John says these prophets have gone out. And John seems to be repeating the warnings of the previous chapters. False prophets have gone out from among us, and with, with it they bring false teachings, false doctrines. What does the Bible say? That just before Jesus comes, every wind of doctrine would be astir, right? Every wind of doctrine would be blowing. So here in 1 John chapter 4, mind you, chapter 4, you would think John would have had ample time in the first three chapters to warn us about deception. But yet here he is again, starting chapter 4, warning about uh, false prophets and being deceived. So should we be concerned with these warnings of John? I would say yes. Don't you think? We ought to at least know what John is speaking of. We ought to at least know what, uh, what, God is, what we are battling with. And so we certainly need to heed the warnings and even examine carefully from the Word of God these warnings. And that's what we're going to do this morning. So the question now is, how do you try the spirits? How do you test the spirits? John says, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits. So how do we do that? Do we speculate on what the future might hold? And say, oh, look, this is happening and this is happening and Russia's the bear and China's something else and put that together and, oh, look, that means this and this is what's going to happen. Is that how we, is that how we uh, uh, read God's Word? Is that how we prove the Spirit? No, absolutely not. Absolutely not. Do we rely on the traditions of our forefathers? You know, we say, well, listen, my father did this, my grandfather, my great-grandfather, it's okay. My, we've been doing this for, all the world is doing it, it must be okay. We don't, we don't rely on the traditions of man, do we? We test the spirits, brothers and sisters. If we profess, profess to be a Christian, then you and I will test the spirits. We will prove all things by using the Word of God and the Word of God alone. Now, I have an interesting uh, story to tell you. As I prepared, I, I, I actually had this prepared, and uh, the, the Lord spoke to me and said, listen, why don't you send a copy to a friend of mine? I won't mention his name. Um, he's not an Adventist. He's barely even a Christian. And I've been talking with him and witnessing, to him, but it's hard. And he said, why don't you send him a copy of what you just, and asked him to, um, you know, critique it for you. And I thought, okay. And so I did. And I sent him, uh, I asked him if I could do that. He said, yeah, yeah, I'd be happy to help. And so I sent him, and uh, he, he, you know, took him a little while, uh, almost a day, and he finally got back with me, and he gave me his comments. And then he said, man, he said, I had no idea that uh, some of this stuff was, he said, I'm not a Bible student, but he said, it's well documented, and, and I had no idea that these things that are happening, these deceptions are, are promoted by uh, certain individuals and whatnot. And, and, um, and I thought, well, praise be to God. So, you know, sometimes 
sometimes we, God asks us to do things and we think, oh, you know, that's, what am I going to do that for? But there's always a reason. Uh, that young man now is really thinking his upbringing and has questions that he's been calling and texting and asking. And I say, praise God for that, right? Isn't that what we want? We want people to go to the Word of God to prove what is being said. We don't want them just to hear what you're saying and say, well, yeah, that makes sense. I'll agree with that. We want them to go to the Word of God. You know, the great reformer Martin Luther had, had a, a famous saying, sola scriptura, right? Meaning what? Scripture only. And that's how we test the spirits. We go to the Word of God. If it's not in the Word of God, then um, it's not... It's not something you want to continue. You don't want to speculate on the Word of God. You know, today, you can easily find on cable television today preachers that have been talking about prophecy and, and the future and whatnot. And some of the shows have actually been repeated on cable TV because of popular demand. People are eating it up. They're loving it. And, um, you know, you had this guy not uh, a year or so ago uh, say that... that that God told him that he needed a new jet. And now he had a jet, but it was only a $30 million jet, and he needed a $65 million jet, and so he asked God's people to, to get, and God's people gave. And this particular guy, what's interesting, he said, he told his followers, if Jesus were preaching today, he wouldn't be riding on a donkey. I'm like, what? Who was it that rode on a donkey? You know, gee, listen. Just because Jesus lived 2,000 years ago doesn't mean that he couldn't have driven a red Ferrari into Jerusalem. He could. He's God. He could have done that. But he chose a donkey. Anyway, you've got these, and people are eating it up. And they're loving what these people are saying. But what does Isaiah 8.20 say? It says, to the law and to the testimony, if they speak not according to the word of God, this word, there is how much light in them? None. Right? There is no light in them. So we want to go to the Word of God. We, I believe, brothers and sisters, that we are nearing the end of time. And I believe everybody believes that in one form or another, with everything that's happening in the world today. And as we move forward in the annals of, of, of time, we, there seem to be more, more and more doomsday prophets. You, you hear it all the time now on, on cable network and on the radio. And, and these guys have realized that there's big money in doomsday messages, and uh, as this guy found out. And so, but as a pastor, um, I believe that it's my duty to share with you the things that God has shown us from his word regarding doctrines, prophecies, etc., and certainly the last days. And I know that the audience who will hear this message today is probably going to be very, very, very small compared to the audiences that tune into these cable TV uh, televangelists. But that's okay, because I believe that God will bring the message to the ears that he wants to hear. Amen? Amen? Because God is in control, and I believe that. So, Towards the end of Jesus' ministry, you remember the disciples gathered around him and uh, they had several questions. And one of the, Matthew 24, they had several questions. And one of the questions was, what are the signs of your coming? What are the signs of the end, right? When are you coming back? Tell us, we want to know. And Jesus responded in Matthew 24 on three separate occasions, but we read in, from verses 3 to 8, Jesus responded, for many have come in my name saying, I am the Christ and shall deceive many. And then he said, take heed, lest you be deceived. Right? You remember those words? Good. So Jesus, at the end of his ministry, he too is warning about future deceptions. The apostle Paul, he also warns about these deceptions. In 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 3 and 4, if you're following along, it reads like this. It says, For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lusts shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. 
and they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned into fables. What is truth? God's word is truth, right? And according to Paul, in the end times, people, they will, they will close their ears, they will turn away from God's truth because they will, they've been led by deception, by fables, by stories. And so God's word is truth. So let's dive into that truth today to see what God's word reveals about end time doctrines. Now, there are many deceptions flying around um, in the world today. And certainly, we're not going to have time to delve into all of these deceptions. It would be impossible to try and cover all of these deceptions in one meeting. But I want to share with you today probably what I believe is the greatest deception in the Christian world today. And that is the idea that Sunday is the new Sabbath. What do the scriptures have to say about such a supposed change of the Sabbath that God established from Saturday to Sunday and subsequently worshiping on Sunday? Well, the scriptures say this about Sunday Sabbath. The scripture said this about worshiping on Sunday. Listen carefully. The scripture says absolutely nothing about either one. Absolutely nothing. So why, do, why does the world worship on Sunday? Why do we regard Sunday as the new Sabbath? Well, I'm going to ask you to stay tuned. And those of you watching online, watching from home, stay tuned. I'm going to, sh to show you at the end of our presentation today exactly where this idea, this deception came from. Sunday is not even mentioned in the New Testament. Now, um, so why do we worship on Sunday? Well, there are many reasons, depending on who you ask and... and uh, um, uh, what mood they're in. There are several different reasons that they will give as to why they worship on Sunday. We're going to examine some of them today, but none of them, none of those reasons are scriptural. And remember what Isaiah said, to the law and to the testimony, if they speak not according to God's word, there is no light in them, right? And so we're going to take a look at some of these texts. Now, while the term Sunday doesn't appear in the New Testament, the term first day of the week does appear on eight separate occasions. Seven, most of those have nothing to do, it's just a, a mention, a frame of time. But there are a few that some people will hold on to as evidence that we should worship on Sunday or that Sunday was changed. But I would submit to you that each time the first day of the week is mentioned in the Scripture, there is absolutely no title of holiness or sanctity, special sacredness attached to it. None whatsoever. So let's um, let me get to the next slide here. So let's take a look now at, um, at this idea that Sunday is the new Sabbath. People will say probably the most popular um, answer when you ask people why do you worship on Sunday instead of, of Saturday, probably the most popular answer or certainly one of the most popular answers is this, that they claim that Sunday, they keep Sunday holy in honor of the resurrection. After all, Jesus did rise from the grave on the first day of the week. That's very clearly established in Luke 23, and then in the beginning of the end of Luke 23 and the beginning of Luke 24, right? It says on the seventh day, the Sabbath, they went to the tomb to anoint the body, but because it was the Sabbath day, they turned around and went home. They came back on the first day of the week, and the tomb was empty. So there's no, no doubt that Jesus did rise from the dead on uh, the first day of the week. Now, um, people say that this resurrection uh, is 
reason for them to change the Sabbath from uh, the seventh day of the week to the first day of the week. But you know, communion, the, the, the ordinance of communion is actually what symbolizes the, uh, the death, the baptism, uh, the death of Christ. You read that in 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 11, verses 20 through, through 24. And just as communion symbolizes um, the death of Christ, baptism symbolizes the resurrection of Christ. Not Sunday worship, but baptism. You read about that in Romans chapter 6, verses 1 through 6. And I'm giving you the reference because we don't have time today. Our time is limited. But again, prove all things. Go to the Word of God. Don't take my word for it. Go look up these texts. Read these texts. Make, be like the Bereans. Prove all things. So Romans 6, verses 1 through 6, tell us there that the symbol of Jesus' resurrection is not worship on the day of the sun, that was adapted into Christianity by uh, early pagan Rome's sun worship, but it is indeed the beautiful ceremony of baptism, which is a symbol of a new life transformed by the wonder-working power of Jesus Christ. And of course, that takes place when we come out of the watery grave of baptism. That old person symbolically dies, is, is buried in that water, and out comes that new person filled with the Holy Spirit. This is the symbol of the resurrection of Christ. Um, and it's a beautiful, uh, uh, beautiful uh, connection. But there's no connection to Sunday worship. Now, to observe Sunday instead of the first day of the week, instead of the seventh day Sabbath, because Christ rose from the dead on Sunday, is actually a tradition that has been handed down from generation to generation. And again, stay tuned. I'm going to show you exactly where that came from at the end of the message. Do you remember the words of, um, of Christ to his disciples regarding traditions in Matthew chapter 7, verse 7? Do you remember what he said? He said, how be it, in vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrines, what? The commandments of men, right? So where do we want to be today? Do we want to be a people who uh, are swayed back and forth by the traditions of men? Or are we, do we want to be a people who are grounded in the commandments of God? Obviously, the answer is the latter for all of us, right? So Jesus said, and it's interesting because Sabbath is all about worship. Sunday has been made all about worship. And Jesus uses the term worship here when he says, In vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. Now, Pastor, you say, well, there's another text in Acts chapter 20. So open your Bibles there, Acts chapter 20, verses 6 through verse 13. And here we say, and again, this is another very common uh, passage that is used to support the idea that Sunday is the new Sabbath. And people will say, look, uh, the, the disciples met on the first day of the week. We read about it in Acts chapter 20. First of all, the whole... Um, the whole dialogue, the whole uh, uh, um, situation there in Acts 20 is recorded not because they were worshiping, but because Paul worked a mighty miracle when Eutychus, who was one of the parishioners listening to a sermon, fell asleep, fell out of the, the rafters and died, and Paul brought him back to life. Can you imagine how embarrassing for poor Eutychus, right? Coming to church and you fall asleep? We would never do such a thing, would we? But let's be fair to Eutychus. They were, Paul was preaching all day long. And as a matter of fact, we see there in Acts uh, chapter 20, verse 7, that it was clear that this was a night meeting. They were now in the dark part of the day. And um, in Bible times, as you know, the dark part of the day is preceded by the light part. So first comes the light, and we read that in Genesis chapter 1. Uh, God created first was the day, then came the evening. 
the morning and the evening were the first day. So this was actually a Saturday night meeting. Paul had been preaching all day long, and poor Eutychus just got a little sleepy, and he just happened to be in a place uh, where you don't, on a seat where you don't want to fall asleep in this particular seat, but he did, and he fell out, and Paul, uh, through the power of the Holy Spirit, raised him back to life. This is the purpose of Acts 27. This is why it's recorded. It's not because they were worshiping, but let's continue. Um, as a matter of fact, by the way, the very next day we read that Paul, which now would be the first day of the week, Paul travels by foot to Essos, and then he sailed to Mytilene. And if Paul had considered Sunday as sacred, then why would he spend the entire day traveling on the first day of the week instead of worshiping? Right? It doesn't make sense. And, and by the way, it's interesting to note too, if the Sabbath was changed because of the resurrection of Christ, don't you think the disciples would have known that? Uh, they were the closest people to Christ, right? But as we are going to see, uh, they, were conti they continued to worship on the Sabbath. So Paul, the record shows that Paul was actually obedient to the Sabbath commandment here in Acts chapter 20. It has nothing to do with Sunday worship. And in, you know, think about this. Um, think about this for just a minute. Uh, I think there should be a, something coming up on the screen there. Um, think about this. Paul continued to worship on Sabbath long after Christ had died. So you might say, well, the change did, wasn't immediate. It was like a year later or a couple of years. No, Paul ministered in the book of Acts. You can see there in Acts 13, Acts 16, Acts 17, Acts 18. All of these accounts are accounts of Paul continuing to worship on the Sabbath day. In fact, in Acts 18, I believe it is, he was in um, uh, uh, um, uh, Antica, um, well, no, I can't remember where he went, but uh, he was in this place for, for a year and a half. Now, a year and a half, and it says he worshiped every Sabbath to the Jews and the Gentiles. So a year and a half is 78 Sabbaths. So Paul continued to worship on the seventh day Sabbath. But pastor, in Acts chapter 20 verse 7, we read that the disciples broke bread on the first day of the week. Now wouldn't this mean that, that Sunday worship, uh, that it was now a Sunday worship service? But note this, my friends, on the bottom of your screen you see Acts chapter 2 verse 46. And it says there, and they continued daily with one accord in the temple, and they broke bread from house to house. They broke bread every single day, right? And they ate their meat with gladness and singleness of heart. So according to this passage, it was the custom of the disciples to break bread daily. And... Um, Look at the last half. If you look at the last half of the 20th chapter in the book of Acts, it gives us a summary of what, what is probably one of the most important sermons that was ever preached by Paul on, on this particular trip, certainly. And, and, um, and it's one, uh, it's the only one that, that describes in detail. And the, an examination of the context, especially in verse 15, would indicate that it was probably preached that sermon was probably preached on a Wednesday. On a Wednesday. Acts chapter 20, as you keep reading. They broke bread every day. Paul preached on a Wednesday. Should we conclude from that that Wednesday is the new Sabbath? Absolutely not. Just because the disciples met and preached with congregations and people uh, on every day of the week does not make that day a Sabbath. We do the same thing today. You know, we have, we have seminars, uh, we have camp meetings, we preach on Friday, Saturday, Sunday, we have midweek services. Wednesday, does that mean that Wednesday, because we, we have a tent meeting or whatever on a Wednesday, does that mean Wednesday is the new Sabbath? Of course not. And it did not mean that in the disciples' day either. They broke bread daily, and according to Acts chapter 20, uh, this very powerful sermon that Paul preached, most likely, uh, this is after the, 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 the Sabbath one here where, where he raised Eutychus from the dead. Uh, later on in Acts 20, he preached again, and it looks like it was on a Wednesday. Now, but making Wednesday the new Sabbath would be the natural conclusion we reach 
from the logic set forth that Sunday is the new Sabbath because Paul broke bread and preached on Sunday. Then we would have to read, oh, no, now it's Wednesday. So the argument doesn't really hold water, um, and certainly it takes more than preaching a sermon to make a day holy. You think about this. It, makes, it takes more than preaching a sermon to reverse, reverse, right? Think about that word for a minute. It takes more than preaching a sermon to reverse a divine command by God to sanctify and to make holy the seventh day Sabbath. And yet that's what we, that's what we do. Exodus chapter 20 tells us all about that. Well, someone else said, well, you know, if Paul preached then on the first day of the week in Acts 20, and then he went on later and he preached on a Wednesday, what difference does it make? What difference does it make what day uh, we worship? And this is another uh, question that you get uh, uh, very, very, uh, very um, often uh, when it comes to the Sabbath. In, Acts, in Romans 14 is where they quote, and starting with verse 5, it says, One man esteems one day above another. Ah, there you go. See, that's it. Any day at all. And that's the argument. That's what people conclude from this text. Uh, another esteems every day alike. Let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. And people say, there it is. You can choose any day you want, and, and you can worship it any day you want. Romans 14 verifies that. No, it doesn't. No, it doesn't. It's, first of all, you need to keep reading. And secondly, you need to understand sometimes it's helpful to carefully notice what a passage of Scripture does not say as well as what it does say. You see, verses 5 and 6 of Romans chapter 14 that you see on the screen say absolutely nothing about worship or about the Sabbath. Doesn't mention worship, doesn't mention the Sabbath. They simply talk about regarding a day. Now, to say that this particular day is Sabbath is a totally unwarranted assumption. We're just, we're just guessing. Oh, well, they were talking about Sabbath. How do you know? We need to continue reading. You need to read what comes before and what comes after. Now, in Romans 14, chapter, chapter 14, verse 1, it kind of sets the tone for the entire passage. It indicates that the discussion that they're having focuses on doubtful disputations, is what Paul calls it in Romans 14, 1. Doubtful disputations. Or in other words, they were disputing matters of doubt, doubtful matters, things that they weren't clear on. Now, let me ask you this. Was the seventh day of Sabbath an issue that the Jews were not clear on? Not at all. They were rigid. As a matter of fact, they had gone to the opposite extreme, right? They had made the Sabbath, they had reverenced the Sabbath so much, much that they had taken the reverence away from God, the Holy, and they had made it a day of, of, of how they are better than everybody else. And maybe that's what's left a bad taste in people's mouths about the seventh day of Sabbath. I don't know. But that's not Sabbath worship, is it? So the Jews certainly knew about, they weren't disputing the seventh day Sabbath. The key to the passage is found in verse 6, which is on your screen. Look at what it says. He that regards one day regards it unto the Lord. And he that regards not the day to the Lord, he does not regard it. He that eats, eats to the Lord. For he giveth God thanks. And he that eateth not, to the Lord he eateth not and giveth God, not giveth God and giveth God thanks. So the issue revolved here not around the seventh day of Sabbath, but it revolved around fasting. It revolved around fast days. You know, when you re restra refrain from eating on a certain day, it's called a fast. And so it wasn't about the Sabbath day. You see, some Jewish Christians believed that they uh, that there was a particular merit in fasting on certain days. In other words, they believe that if they fast on these certain days, that they will have more favor with God than uh, people that don't. And they even began to judge others based on their standards. Because they were fasting, they thought everybody else should fast. Right? You know, we do that sometimes as Christians too, don't we? 
We, we kind of get this thing in our head, and go, well, I'm, I'm doing this, I'm exercising daily, so you should exercise daily. God wants us to be healthy. Well, well, that's exactly what was happening. We don't want to be, you don't want to be like the Pharisees. We don't want to be like the, the, the Jews back then, right? So this is what they were doing. They were judging others by their own standards. The Pharisees, they fasted at least twice a week, and they boasted about it. Can you remember an instance in Scripture where you see the Pharisees boasting? You can find it in Luke chapter 18, right? Verse 12. And, uh, but here, in, in, and what did Jesus say about their boasting? Uh, you know, he, he said that what they're doing uh, it means nothing. But the man who was humble and contrite and quiet and pleading with God, he was the one that had favor with God. But nonetheless, in, in Romans 14, Paul is pointing out simply that to fast or not to fast on a certain day is a matter of individual conscience. It's not a matter of God's command, and it has nothing to do with the seventh day of Sabbath. Certainly nothing to do about changing the Sabbath, and it certainly doesn't give us license to decide which day we choose to make Sabbath. Right? Okay. Um, God has nailed the Sabbath to the cross. Have you ever heard that before? That's another common uh, uh, argument, isn't it? And it's found in Colossians 2, verses 14 through 17. You see, the Ten Commandments, um, as a matter of fact, uh, let's open our Bibles. Let's read that text. Um, let's just read that text. Um, sorry, my wife is just uh, texting me. Thank you, Cheryl. She's giving me another text that came to mind there. So praise God. It's good to have two preachers, right? So look at now. Um, let me open up on my device here. Um, uh, my Bible, and we're going to look at, uh, at uh, Colossians chapter 2. And I want you to open it up wherever you are as well. Open up your Bible. We're starting with verse um, 14. And it says, Now, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took out of the way, nailing it to the cross. Now, I want to stop there for just a second. Um, because first of all, it says here that blot out the handwriting of ordinances. Was the Decalogue written by hand? That is God's Ten Commandment law? Was it written by hand? No, it wasn't. According to Exodus 31, it was written by the finger of God. And then, when Moses came down the mountain, he saw them worshiping, and Aaron said, oh, this, they brought me their jewelry, and up came this beautiful calf, and we worshiped it. Moses dropped the Decalogue, dropped the two commandments of stone, and broke them. And what did God say? Ah, you know what, Moses, just, just copy them down as you remember them. No. God said, come back up onto the mountain. You can see this recorded in Deuteronomy chapter 10, verses 1 through 4. Moses went into the mountain a second time, and for the second time, God wrote them with his own finger. So there's no handwriting of ordinances associated with the Ten Commandment law. So that alone tells me the Ten Commandment law is not in play here. But let's continue. Uh, it also says there that, that the ordinance that were against us. So in other words, these ordinances had become a burden to the Jews. Let me ask you this. Is God's Ten Commandment law a burden? Is, is worshiping God a burden? Is honoring your parents a burden? Kids, you don't get to answer that one. Is, is stealing, uh, uh, you know, is, is coveting. I mean, all of these things aren't burdens. They are there for our admonition, for our uh, good, and for our well-being. So, again, just here from reading in verse 14, we see that it's not the handwriting, it's not the finger of God, it's a handwriting of ordinances. And secondly, they were against us. The Ten Commandments have never been against us, friends. God gave us the Ten Commandments as a guide, as a mirror. We look there to see where, we're, where we are on our journey. But it goes on. Look at it says. He took it out of the way and nailing it to the cross. So, so these ordinances, these handwritten ordinances, were told that Jesus took them out of the way and he nailed them to the cross. In other words, they were no longer binding. But it goes on. It says, verse 15, And having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. Let no man therefore judge you in meat, or in drink, or in respect of a holy day. Ah, pastor, here we go again. See, any day, any day can be a holy day. Let's, let's read. 
Let no man judge you in respect of a holy day or the new moon or of the Sabbath. What's that last word? Days. Plural. Right? So what on earth is going on here? The Ten Commandments, first of all, uh, and then verse 17 says, these are a shadow of things to come, but the body is of Christ. First of all, the Ten Commandment law of God was not a shadow of things to come. And you can read about that in, 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 in Colossians further. Instead, this, the Ten Commandments dealt with eternal principles. And certainly the Sabbath commandment in the Decalogue pointed not forward to something that was to come, but the Sabbath pointed backwards to creation, doesn't it? God uh, rested on the seventh day and blessed it and made it holy. So it's, it's creation. Also, it's interesting to note here that the, when people say that the, the commandments were nailed to the cross and they use Colossians chapter 2, it's interesting to note they're not talking about all the commandments. They're saying, oh no, the other nine are still good, but the Sabbath was nailed to the cross. So, so they're not nailing now the Decalogue. It's only one-tenth of the Decalogue. Brothers, the more you get into this, the more nonsensical it becomes. But the Bible goes on, and, and let's, let's just go on too for the sake of time here. Look at Acts 15, verse 5. It says, But there rose up certain of the sect of the Pharisees, which believed, saying that it was needful to circumcise them and to command them to keep the law of who? Of Moses. So what law is being referred to here? The law of Moses. You see, the answer is giving, given to us clearly in Acts 15.5. The, the, the phrase, the law of Moses, was the one that was, gen, was a phrase that was generally used by the Jews to describe that extended group of laws known as the ceremonial laws that were handwritten by the hand of Moses, such as circumcision, uh, purifying meat offerings, drink offerings, uh, which uh, uh, under the dictation of God, certainly, but entirely, these laws were apart from the Decalogue. These were separate laws, right? So God said to Moses, I'm giving you the Ten Commandments law, but I want to give you other laws. I want to give you laws on hygiene. I want to give you laws on uh, proper meats to eat and drinks to drink and how to, to prepare them and things of that nature. Moses wrote these laws down in a book, and it was the carrying out of the numerous injunctions of this law that Mo uh, of Moses that caused Peter to remove himself from the Gentile believers. So what was happening here? In Colossians chapter 2, certain laws of ordinances were nailed to the cross. Was it the Ten Commandment law? No, as it's often claimed it was. But it wasn't the Ten Commandments or the Fourth Commandment. Not at all. The ceremonial laws with its types and shadows that pointed forward to the death of Christ, right? You get that? These laws pointed forward to the death of Christ. The Sabbath points backwards to creation. But it says these are a shadow of things to come, right? So these ceremonial laws that pointed towards the death of Jesus and had no further meaning beyond the cross, in fact, these laws were abolished at the cross. They were done away with at Calvary. Jesus, we just read in Colossians that he removed them. Right? Because they were contrary to the Christian. And you know, in Matthew 27, when Jesus died on the cross, we read about the tearing of the veil in the temple where these offerings were made. And, the, uh, and that, of course, that indicates the end of that ordinance of animal sacrifices. There was no more need to bring animal sacrifices. Why? Because Jesus was the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. And... Um, in fact, Ephesians 2.15 says that Jesus abolished the law of commandments contained in the ordinances. So this is why Paul wrote in Colossians 2.16 that we are no longer judged by meat offerings and drink offerings and Sabbath days, which were a shadow of things to come. Now note that these ceremonial Sabbaths, these were yearly Sabbaths, 
And they didn't always fall on the seventh day of the week. Uh, they, they fell on a certain day in a certain month uh, every year. And as you know, a certain date on a certain month every year falls on a different day every year, right? And so these were, they were called Sabbaths. They were called holy days. But they were not the Sabbath of the Lord our God, were they? As a matter of fact, in Leviticus 23, there's a text here I want to share with you. You can see it on your screen. It says, Leviticus 23, verse 37 and 38, look at this. It says, these are the feasts of the Lord, which you shall proclaim to be holy, holy convocations, to offer an offering made by fire unto the Lord, a burnt offering and a meat offering, a sacrifice, a drink offering, everything upon this day, beside the Sabbaths of the Lord and beside your gifts. So what is Paul saying here? He's saying that these Sabbaths, these holy days, are separate from God's Sabbath, from the seventh-day Sabbath. And so now the mystery of Colossians 2, verse 14 through 17, is completely cleared up. The law of the yearly Sabbaths is, uh, with all their meat offerings and drink offerings and everything that went along with it, is what was nailed to the cross. Not the Ten Commandment law uh, with its weekly Sabbath. Uh, this was not affected at all by the blotting out of ordinances, handwritten ordinances. So, in a last-ditch effort now, for, believe, for people, for even Christians, to believe a lie, they often say, ah, you know, that's all well and good, but we're saved by, uh, we're saved by faith. We, we don't have to keep the law. You ever heard that? You know, Paul teaches that Christians are saved not by faith, but by grace through faith. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8, right? He says, faith is the hand that takes the salvation that's freely offered by Jesus Christ. Faith does not lead us to disobedience. Faith leads us to obedience. In fact, what does it say? For by grace are you saved through faith, not of yourselves. It is a gift from God. And then verse 10 says, not by works, lest any man should boast. Let me go. I'm losing the text here. It left my mind. Ephesians chapter 2. I want to quote it to you properly because it's important. Not by works, lest any man should boast. Yes. And verse 10. Listen to this. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, as God before ordained that we should walk in them. What are these good works? Obedience to God's word. So we are saved by faith through grace so that we can be obedient to God's word. Not so that we can say, oh, I don't have to keep the commandments. I don't have to do what God says. I'm saved by, I'm saved by faith. You know, Paul states in no uncertain terms in Romans 3.31, he says, do we then make void, uh, make the law through, uh, do we then make void the law through faith? And I love how he ends, he says, God forbid, right? In other words, he's like, I wouldn't dream of doing that. So where did this idea then that Sunday is the new Sabbath come from? Well, I told you earlier to stay tuned and, um, and we'd get to it. So here it is. I hope, I hope you're sitting down. And, and I forgot to bring this little book with me. I should have brought it. But I hope you're sitting down uh, for this, especially those of you viewing at home. Why do Christians today worship on Sunday? You know, I grew up in the Catholic Church. I went to Catholic school, and we have what was called a catechism, a Catholic catechism. And uh, in our catechism, we, we never opened the Bible in our school. It was always the catechism. And in the Catholic catechism, you may or may not be able to read this, uh, there is a certain uh, a section on page 50, and I have my catechism. I still have my catechism. I was going to bring it with me, and I forgot. But uh, I have my catechism from when I was in school, and um, in, on page 50, the, it, it asks the question, which is the third commandment? And the answer is given. The third commandment is, remember that you keep holy the Sabbath day. Now, I know all our Bible students say, wait a minute, that's the fourth commandment. But understand that in Catholicism, uh, there, there are the second commandment, which talks about worshiping idols, is not there. You know, you bow down, and that, that, they took that out. But everyone knows that there's 10 commandments. And so what they did is they took the 
last commandment, which is, Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's goods, nor shall thou covet thy neighbor's wife. And they broke that into two. So the ninth is, Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's goods. The tenth is, Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife. So, so that kind of, by taking out the second commandment, everyone after that is bumped up one. So the fourth becomes the third. And that's why they answer, Which is the third commandment? The third commandment is, Remember that you keep holy the Sabbath day. And then the question is asked, which day is the Sabbath day? And the answer in the Catholic Catechism, Saturday is the Sabbath day. Then the question is asked, why do we observe Sunday instead of Saturday? And the answer is given, we observe Sunday instead of Saturday because the Catholic Church transferred the solemnity, the holiness, from Saturday to Sunday. And then the question is asked, why did the Catholic Church substitute Sunday for Saturday? And the answer is, the church substituted Sunday for Saturday because Christ rose from the dead on Sunday and the Holy Ghost descended upon the apostles on Sunday. And then the question is said, by what authority did the church substitute Sunday for Saturday? And the answer is, the church substituted Sunday for Saturday by the plentitude of that divine power which Jesus Christ bestowed upon her. Now, if you are a practicing Catholic, and you grew up uh, in Catholic schools, most likely you were taught, as I was taught, that the Catholic Church has the authority to change God's Word. That's what they taught us in school. And we were okay with that. Uh, and that's still being taught today, that the Catholic Church has authority over God's Word and therefore can make the changes as we progress into new decades and new generations. They can make changes to fit the times. And so uh, here, in their catechism, they don't acknowledge, they don't try to hide which day was the Sabbath day. They clearly admit it. Saturday is the Sabbath day. But because, paraphrasing now, but because we're so special in God's eyes, we are able to change God's divine ordinance, and we've made it now our man-made ordinance, and that is Sunday is the new Sabbath. But let me share with you a few other statements here from some um, Catholic uh, documents. This is taken from the Catholic World magazine, uh, page 809. This is taken from uh, an article that was printed in March 1994, so it's 25 years ago. But look at what it says. The sun was a foremost god with heathendom. There is in truth something royal, kingly about the sun making it a fit emblem of Jesus, the Son of Justice. Hence, the church in these countries would seem to have said, talking about heathen countries, keep that old pagan name. It shall remain consecrated, sanctified. And thus, the pagan Sunday, dedicated to Balder, the pagan god, became the Christian Sunday sacred to Jesus. So there is, no, there is no denying where the change from Sabbath to Sunday came from. If you want to know why today Christians practice Sunday as the new Sabbath, you only have to look to the Catholic Church. There's a few other statements here I want to share with you from Catholic sources. This is from the Catholic Mirror. It says, reason and sense demand the acceptance of one or the other of these alternatives either Protestantism and the keeping holy of Saturday or Catholicity and the keeping holy of Sunday. Compromise is impossible. What, what are they saying here? They're saying, look, if you claim to be a Protestant, you should be worshiping on Sabbath. If you're worshiping on Sunday, you're a Catholic. You can call yourself whatever you want, but you are following the ordinances of the Catholic Church and you, you may claim to be a Protestant, but if you worship on Sunday, you're a Catholic. And that's basically what they're saying. Here's another one. Christendom is indebted to the Catholic Church for the institution of Sunday as the Sabbath day. Again, taken from, taken from the Sunday mirror. Christendom is indebted to the Catholic Church for the institution of Sunday as the Sabbath day. Friends, I just want you to know if you are worshiping on Sunday, you are not honoring God the way he asked you to honor him. 
He said, remember to keep holy the Sabbath day, the seventh day. For in six days shall thou labor and do all your work. And then it says that God blessed the seventh, the seventh day, sanctified the seventh day, made that day holy. And now man is coming along. The Catholic Church have come along and said, no, well, you know, that's what God said, but we're making Sunday holy. And they're, they don't, they're, not, they're not ashamed to admit it. They're not hiding it. And you have to give them credit for that. They're not trying to sneak it in. This is an open, bold-faced deception. This is kind of like an in-your-face deception. It's like we are so powerful, we are so great, uh, the whole world wanders after us that we can throw this deception right in your face and you know what? You follow right along. You're either a Protestant and worship on Saturday or you're a Catholic and worship on Sunday. That's what the Catholic Church is saying. Just a, a one more here, uh, one or two more. In keeping Sunday, again, this is taken from uh, uh, the question box, which is a Catholic uh, uh, a book on page 99. It says, in keeping Sunday, non-Catholics are simple, uh, that it says, simply following the practice of the Catholic Church for 1,800 years, a tradition and not a Bible ordinance. Now, what did Jesus say about traditions and worship in Mark 7, verse 7? In vain do they worship me teaching for doctrines the commandments of, in this case, the Catholic Church. There is no mystery about where Sunday worship came from. It did not come from Calvary. It did not come from the disciples. It came hundreds of years later as these pagan tribes were in, embraced by, by pagan Rome and the emergence of the Catholic Church embraced all these. They embraced Sunday worship. And brothers and sisters, today... Uh, we pro people who, who call themselves Protestants still abide by the ordinance of man. Here's another one. There, there, there are many of these. This is the last one I want to share with you. Had she not such power, that is the church, she could not have done that in which all modern religionists agree with her. She could have substituted the observance of Sunday, the first day of the week, for the observance of Saturday, the seventh day of the week. A change for which there is no scriptural authority. And yet all the world worships on Sunday, it seems like. Why? Prove, John said, test the spirits. Prove all things. Now look, there are many, many more admissive statements from the Catholic Church, and, but, but for the sake of time, we, we, can't, we don't have time to go through them all right now. But the seventh day, the Bible tells us the seventh day is what was blessed by God. It was given at creation in Genesis 2. We're told in Luke chapter 4 that Jesus kept it holy. He went as his custom was on, as his custom was on the Sabbath day. And we're told that Paul and the disciples observed the Sabbath day. We saw those texts in, throughout the book of Acts for years. And not only that, brothers and sisters, in Isaiah 66 is an interesting text that says when, the old, when the, this old earth is destroyed and created anew, that we will worship together in heaven from one Sabbath to the next. Right? Isaiah 66, for those of you taking note, that's verse 22 and 23. Think about this for a moment. God created this, rested on the seventh day and blessed and made it holy at creation. The Jews continued to worship on the Sabbath all through the Old Testament. Still do today, but all through the Old Testament. They worshiped on the seventh day Sabbath. Then along came Jesus. He, as his custom was, worshiped on the Sabbath. Then he was put to death, horribly tortured and died. The disciples continued to worship on Sabbath long after his death. Then all of a sudden, the Catholic Church comes along and says, nope, we're going to change it to Sunday. Now the whole world worships on Sunday. But the Bible says when Jesus comes and we get to heaven, we're going to worship on Sabbath again. Does that make sense? We go Sabbath at creation, Sabbath in the Old Testament, Sabbath with Jesus, Sabbath with the disciples, Sunday for us today, and then Sabbath back in heaven? Why are we breaking that cycle? No scriptural authority is what we hear from the Catholic Church. So why interject the first day of Sunday as, the, as, as, the, as a holy day, only to go back to the seventh day of Sabbath uh, when we get to heaven? Brothers and sisters, the Sabbath 
is part of God's Ten Commandment law and cannot be separated. James chapter 2 says if we break one of those commandments, we break them all. That includes the seventh day Sabbath. You cannot remove that law that was written with the very finger of God. You cannot disregard that law and expect to, be, uh, uh, expect to do what God is asking you to do. Expect to be in harmony. Expect to go, oh, I'm saved by faith. I don't, have to be dis I don't have to be obedient. It's like your child saying, you know, you ask your child to do something, and you go, oh, yeah, yeah, I'll do it, but I'm going to do it my way. And they end up doing it totally, uh, you know, wrong and, and, and improper and getting themselves in trouble. And, and, and you as a parent look at them and say, I told you how to do it. And that's what God is saying to us today. God is saying, I, I showed you. I've given you the way. Why, why, are you, why are you detouring? Why are you going after man's way? I told you how to do it. And we say, it doesn't matter. I can do any day I want. And God says, no, you can't. I didn't give it. I didn't make any day holy. I made the seventh day holy. And we somehow have got it into our minds that it doesn't matter. Would we do that with any other commandment? Thou shalt not commit adultery. I know you're married and I'm married, but it doesn't matter. Come on, we can have an affair. It's no big deal. Or, or we go, well, I know the Bible says not to covet, but man, I'm, I'm getting one of those. That car, wow, that's something. Come on. I'm going, to, I'm going to break into his house and steal that car. Because you know what? It doesn't matter. It really doesn't matter. I'm saved by faith. I, all, that stuff's, all that stuff's nonsense. Brothers and sisters, that is so illogical and so nonsensical, it's ridiculous. And yet we do that with the Seventh-day Sabbath. Many reasons are given. Does God change? No. Hebrews 13, verse 8 says that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And I know that we've focused on Sunday and we're a little over time, uh, but brothers and sisters, you can do your own study on the Sabbath. Open up the Word of God and study which day is the Sabbath. Which day is the Sabbath of creation? Which day was the Sabbath through history? Which day was the Sabbath with Jesus? Which day was the Sabbath uh, with the disciples? And you will come to no other conclusion as you finish the book of Revelation that the seventh day, Sabbath is, the, the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord. So where did Sunday come from? We now know where it came from. It is a great deception, brothers and sisters, that was introduced by the Catholic Church. There are many, many reasons given for Sunday worship, but none of them are biblical. You know, brothers and sisters, Psalm 111, verse 7, says, The works of his hands are verity and judgment. All his commandments are sure. They stand fast forever and ever and are done in truth and uprightness. They stand fast forever and ever. 1 John 3, 4, we studied this a couple of weeks ago. Whosoever commits sin also commits lawlessness, and sin is lawlessness. The King James Version says, Whosoever commits sin transgresses also the law. What law? The law of God. For sin is the transgression of the law. If you break God's law, you are committing sin. If you fail to worship on the Sabbath, knowing that, that it is the seventh day of the week that God sanctified and set aside, and you choose openly to worship on any other day, brothers and sisters, you are disobeying God. It's that simple. And we close with 1 John chapter 4, verse 1. Back to this text. Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. Friends, don't be fooled by the traditions of man. Stay firm in the Word of God. Jesus is coming, and I believe Jesus is coming soon. And brothers and sisters, you and I need to be proving, testing, taking heed, lest we be deceived. Jesus is coming. But you know what? When He comes, He is coming as our friend. He is coming as your friend, as my friend. This world, this world belongs to Satan. This world belongs to the devil. It needs to be destroyed. And Je when Jesus comes back, he's not going to put a band-aid on this world and, and keep on going. This world will be destroyed according to Isaiah. And it will be recreated anew. And in that new earth, we will get back to Sabbath worship. Week after week, the seventh day, as God commanded. And I say, you know what? Even so, come Lord Jesus.